ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself. At the end, forever, you and I will be in heaven or hell, period. End game. In the game of chess, the final strategy to close on your opponent and win the game. The maneuver when there are few pieces left on the board. End game. That's what I've been talking about. The strategy of the evil one in these days to close on existence itself to attack life. It's a coordinated effort, highly intelligent effort, the effort of a master strategist. It's an attack on what we call the transcendentals, those things that are particular of all of existence, all of being. The attack on unity, we see that in so many different ways. Uh, the disunity that we see in families, the split, even as basic as gender, men against women, husbands against wives, polarization. Uh, the disunity is very evident these days. Countries split countries warring against other countries, disunity, attack on unity, one of the very basic attributes of being itself. Attack on truth, we see that in so many different ways, when the truth is assaulted and uh, insulted and trampled underfoot, when lies are elevated to the status of something noble and dignified, which they are not, Attack on goodness, which is basically about sin. That's the moral attack. Attack on beauty. Uh, it's, there's, there's, there is beauty still, certainly in people, in nature. But beauty has been assaulted. Uh, you look around, and it's harder to find now than it, than it used to be. One can say, well, you just have to know where to look. And, and I, that's true, that's true. But you, uh, you have to know where to look, and not, a lot of people don't know where to look. So they, they find themselves more and more isolated, uh, more and more discouraged. Um, art, music, human actions. Uh, these can be very beautiful, or not. They help us, those things help us. Uh, you know, in uh, some of the churches, some of the old churches. Now, in my hometown, um, the Catholic churches, uh, like they did many places, they, they uh, were associated with ethnic groups, uh, immigrants. Uh, when the Irish came to the United States uh, after the potato famine, of course, they, uh, they, they were only Protestants in, in my area. Uh, of, of the world where I grew up in upstate New York. And so the Irish were the first Catholics to settle there, and they built a church, a beautiful church. And then the Italian immigrants came, and they built a church. And then the Polish immigrants came, and they built a church. So we had three Catholic churches, uh, very beautiful churches, in my little hometown. Uh, the art was beautiful. They imported the stained glass from Europe, the marble altars usually came from Italy. And they were little works of art. And people would go into the church on Sunday, assist at Mass, and the beauty of the surroundings helped to elevate the spirit, help you to pray. Uh, visual help. We're, we're not disembodied spirits. We're not angels. We're human beings. We have a spiritual dimension, but we have that bodily dimension, corporeal dimension. And so we, we, we have senses, and they're important. 
so beautiful things to see, to hear, to smell. Uh, the liturgy, uh, the churches help people. You know, life is difficult enough, that beauty, but there's been an attack on beauty. So we have this assault on all these fronts. Unity, truth, good, beauty, and that translates into an attack on life. And that attack on life, as I translate it, means an attack on the Eucharist. For really the Eucharist is the source of life. And I'm talking about not, on, not just physical life, although it can help physical life too, supernatural life, the life of grace, the kind of life that never ends. If you live a hundred years, that's nothing in the context of eternity. That's like the blink of an eye. It'll be just like that it's over with. Uh, you and I are going to blink our eye and that we're going to be right out of here. Nothing, just nothing flat. Doesn't seem like it, maybe, but it is. Those of us who are older can tell those of you who are younger that the older you get, the faster time goes. That may defy the laws of physics, <laughs> but I'll guarantee you there's some kind of truth to it because uh, my time now just flies by. And, and uh, my friends who are older than me uh, tell me that, well, you just wait. <laughs> you think it goes fast now. <laughs> you know, something about the acceleration of time, the older you get. When you're young, it doesn't seem to go that fast, really. You get older, I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 56 now, and uh, man, I blink my eye, and I, I, I'm, sometimes I'm still 14 in, in my head, you know, and, and then I look in the mirror, I say, boy, you ain't 14 anymore, that's for sure, it just goes so fast. All right, that's the attack. Now, what's the counterattack? Um, I mention these negative, you could call them negative things. The only reason I mention them is not because I like talking about negative things. It's just because so many people are unaware of these things. So many people have no idea that there's a fierce battle going on. Oh, they have glimmers and, and um, hints about it here and there, but they can't put the pieces together. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put the pieces together. It, but it's not a negative ending. I mean, the, the, it's true that we have a battle to fight, but we know the outcome. Now, that, that, that's not an excuse not to fight the good fight. We know the outcome. See, th th here, right here, that's the battle, okay? The, that, that's indicative of the battle. But we already know where that leads. You see, the pain of the cross leads to the glory of the resurrection. That's not the end of the story. Jesus suffered. Yep. Jesus died. And Jesus rose. And then he ascended. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. That's our story. You, you, see, you see, right here is the story of your life. Right there is the meaning of your life and mine. We suffer in many different ways. In the course of a life, I mean, sometimes, some people more than others, no doubt. But the, uh, physical pain we endure, emotional pain we endure, rejection, persecution, all kinds of things. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is heaven, forever. Now that's the end of the story. But we're not there yet. We're on our way. In status viator, we are on the way. We are pilgrims, wayfarers, in a sense, cosmic warriors, fighting the good fight of faith. Souls are hanging in the, on the brink. Heaven, hell. Your life makes a difference. 
What's the counterattack? How do we deal with this attack? Very simple, really. Let's take them one at a time. Unity. We see all this, this disunity in the world. Uh, families being torn apart. Countries radically divided. Dissension. Dissent in uh, theology. Parishes warring people inside the parish against each other, pastor against the people, bishops against bishops. Disunity. That's one of the fronts in the battle, one of the places where the attack is taking place. How do you foster unity? How do you foster unity? I'm going to give you, uh, following the theme of what we're doing here, a plan to foster unity, that first front of this, of this battle plan. If you want to foster unity, foster truth. You want to foster unity, foster that which is good and moral. If you want to foster unity, foster beauty. Because remember, these four transcendentals are they're convertible terms, convertible with life itself, existence itself. Be a peacemaker, certainly. You know, you affect unity directly. Don't be a contentious person. Be a peacemaker. But remember this, the only unity possible subsists in truth. Outside of the truth, there is only disunity. Now, th this is wisdom, and not many people have it. In the ecumenical movement, I've mentioned this before. You want unity. You know, you've got to want unity. Why? God wants unity. God is one. And when we say we believe in one God, that speaks not just of numerically one. It is numerically one. There's only one God. But it's much more than that. It's a transcendental unity. That means a strict integrity. God is perfectly, purely, and simply one, not composed of parts. And integrity. It's a godly thing, unity. It's a godly thing to be a peacemaker. You know, you may have it in your family. Okay, you, you get, you, and every family has. Don't feel bad if you've got some disunity in your family. You, you would be, I, you know, I'd have to wonder if you didn't have any. I mean, I'd, I'd be envious of you. You know, it's a great thing. I pray for perfect unity in every family. But uh, don't, don't be uh, surprised that you have some disunity, some, some fighting inside the family. Keep it civil, <laughs> you know. Try, try, don't let it get out of hand. But people say, well, what can I do, Father? You know, I, I've often, you've heard me many times say, look, you need to pray the rosary. And uh, I'm going to say that yet again today. But, but yes, but if I try to get my family to pray the rosary, then, it's, then, then it really gets bad. <laughs> You know, I mean, it gets worse. Man, nobody, they don't want to do that. You know, you've got teenage kids maybe. Man, they've got a lot of things going on in life. You know, I don't have time. You know, you busier than the Pope? That's what I always told them. You busier than the Pope? You don't have time to pray the rosary? You tell me you're busier than the Pope? Man, cut it out. You're not busier than the Pope. And he prays 20 decades every day. How long does it take? Say, say you do five decades. Okay, what's that, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? That's all. Now, in this counterattack, I'm going to recommend some things, concrete recommendations that you do every day. Very simple. Give God an hour. There's 24 hours in every day. Give God one hour. One out of 24, that's all. You've got 23 hours to do all the other stuff. Give God an hour. What you do in that hour is none of my business. That's your business. Go to Mass if you can. That's the most powerful thing you can do, certainly. But not everybody can, can go to Mass every day. If you can go, go as often as you can. I, I strongly suggest that you have a little place in your home to pray little corner, prayer corner, you know. You might not be able to have a whole room, but, but you can have a corner of a room. I remember my grandmother had a, uh, in her house, that it was a small place, 
uh, but she had a corner of the living room, and uh, it was like a chapel in that corner. Uh, she had uh, the infant of Prague there, you know. Remember the infant? She changed the clothes, right, on the infant of. <laughs> <You know? laughs> remember that? They changed the uh, the outfits, the, the liturgical colors, like during Lent. The infant of Prague got purple. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's a tradition. And, and uh, ordinary time, the infant of Prague wore green, right? On the feast days of Our Lady, the infant of Prague got white. Well, that was just a thing, that's a tradition, you know. She, she did that, though. I'd, they did that, and my aunts did it, too, all of her sisters. And, uh, and they had, I think she had set six or seven sisters, and uh, they all did that. She had a crucifix, there was a crucifix in every room. You couldn't get away from Jesus in Grandma's house. <laughs> he was there looking at you. And, uh, you know, a, 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 an image of Our Lady someplace. You don't have to have, a, you know, a hundred things, religious objects every place. But, but one or two, you know? Every Catholic home should have these, these and why do we do that? A uh, simple reason. They remind us of the one we love. You know, it's not idolatry or something. You know, if I, if I carry my mother's picture in my wallet, I'm not an idolater. It just reminds me of my mother, that's all. And so if I have Our Lady's picture on the wall and in my chapel, that reminds me, I don't worship the picture. It just reminds me of the one I love. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, a, a little corner to pray. Um, say the rosary every day. Now, I don't, I don't get too specific with too many things because the way you pray is your business. It's not mine. I can't tell you exactly how to pray. There's latitude in that. You can pray any way you want. As long as you spend time with God. Uh, you might just talk spontaneously to God as you would talk to a friend, talk to your father. You should do that. Uh, but the rosary uh, is special. That's the prayer of the gospel. See, for Christians, the gospel has special significance. You know, the gospel, is the, is, that, that's special. All the scripture is special. All the word of God is special. But the gospel is, is in the highest place. That's what Jesus did and said takes real special significance the word of god when you pray the rosary you're praying the gospel now m many of you heard me give that talk before on the rosary but I, I have to keep saying this over and over again a lot of times people uh, a lot of the same people come to hear me different places say man i bet you i've heard you say that a hundred times father i said would you get it yet <laughs> you know my, my psychologist friends tell me that you have to hear something 16 times before the human mind grasps it once and for all. Uh, the prayer of the rosary is the prayer of the gospel. You know, the rosary is, is it's kind of like us. We have a body and a soul, right? The soul is the form of the body, we say in metaphysics. The soul is the form of the body. It's what gives life to the body. The soul of the rosary is the meditation on the 20 mysteries. Now, there's 20 now. I think you all know that. There used to be 15, but, but the Holy Father gave us the luminous mysteries. And so we've got 20 mysteries of the rose. You meditate on those mysteries. What are those mysteries? Those are events, events, happenings from the gospel. Okay, so you're meditating. On, and what's the sum and substance of that? Well, Jesus, what is the gospel? The word means good news. What's the good news? Good news is Jesus. The good news isn't just something. The good news is somebody. So when you're praying the gospel, the rosary, you're praying Jesus. And what happens? You begin to interiorize Christ. You become who you are, the body of Christ, empowered to do the works of Jesus. That's the rosary. That's powerful. That is one of the major weapons in this counterattack on evil. So if you want to effect unity, foster the truth, foster goodness, foster beauty, because all these transcendental realities are interconnected and compenetrated, okay? And you might say, well, how can I, how can I foster the truth? Well, in the first place, you've got to somehow interiorize the reality that the truth is Jesus Christ. Now, he said it himself. 
You just read the Bible, and, it, and, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. I am the truth, Jesus said. You've got to love the truth. You've got to cultivate a relationship with Jesus. You've got to love the Lord Jesus Christ. By loving the truth, you are loving Jesus because they are one and the same. What did Jesus teach? He taught himself. And who is Jesus? The Word of God, the Father's only Son. And so when we study our faith, we're studying God. And that's why we should do it. And that's why we should love to do it. It's not just a, a, a sterile, cold exercise. It's something, it, it's a relationship is what it is. Everyone. Now, and I mean everyone. You know, I look around, I see some young, younger people in here. And I look around, and I see some older people in here. Man, some of y'all old. <laughs> Even older than me. Doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. Learn your faith. There are dire consequences for not learning your faith. And those consequences do not merely impact on you. They impact on other people. Starting with your family and then radiating out from there into your workplace, into everybody you come in contact with. And I don't mean you have to go into your workplace and preach a sermon. Uh, no, probably don't do that. <laughs> you all you know, you know what I mean. But you, you do preach a sermon. And, and I'll tell you what. Um, I use the example of a, a story from the life of St. Francis of Assisi. One time he said, uh, Brother Leo, let's go to town and preach. So Brother Leo and St. Francis, they went off to the nearest town, and they went in the city square. There's a town in Perugia, in Italy. And they walked, they started walking around together. You know, they were in their old ragged Franciscan habits. And they walked around and around and around the city square, and finally, after about an hour of it, Brother Leo said to St. Francis, but Francis, I thought we were gonna preach. And he said, yeah, we just did. Let's go home now. How did they preach? By their witness, by their presence. Everybody knew who they were. They knew they'd given up their life for God. They were poor. They were humble. They gave witness. You give witness wherever you are. Now, people know your life is the most eloquent sermon you will ever preach. This the witness of a good, clean, solid, faithful, Catholic and Christian life is the most powerful sermon you could ever give. It'll convert more hearts than anything. Man, talk is cheap. Action is something else. They'll know. I know people all over the world who do this. And, you, and it's amazing uh, the effect that they can. I know one man, a friend of mine up in my, around my hometown. He was an engineer. He's retired now, but he worked for the state. He was um, a road engineer, you know, for the state highway system. And, uh, oh, Charlie, he, he was, uh, he, and he still does it, I'm sure. He's just a good example. Uh, maybe at times a little bit overbearing, maybe. But everybody knew that if they had a problem, they could go to Charlie. They, know, they knew he'd listen with great compassion. Believe me, they might have made fun of him a time or two here and there. But you wait and see. When they get in trouble, when they need a friend, when they need a shoulder to cry on, when they need help, guess who they go to? That's right. They go to Charlie. And what happens? God then works on people. All you have to do after they know who you are and where you're coming from, you just wait for them to be led to your doorstep, and they will be. And another one, he was uh, about my age, worked for the post office in my hometown for years and years and years. I don't know if he's retired yet or not, but uh, he's getting close to it. Good Catholic. He, he just was a, one of those solid guys. He didn't wear religion on his shirt sleeve. 
He wasn't always preaching and evangelizing actively, but he was just as wholesome and pure and solid a guy as you'd ever want to meet, and everybody knew it. You wouldn't use foul mouth language in front of old Ray. Not more than once, because he didn't tolerate it. He just flat didn't tolerate it. First, they might have got bent out of shape. After a while, they just didn't do it around him. After a while, it didn't happen at all in that post office. Because they just kind of liked not having air pollution flying around and all that cursing and, and bad language. They found that they were better off without it. And then one thing led to another, and, and the people start coming back to church. Little things, little things. Uh, another way to fight that good fight, the counterattack. Now that I've said little things, the little way of St. Therese. You know, St. Therese is a doctor of the church. There are only 33 doctors of the church in the entire history of the church. St. Therese, little flower, is one of them. And, and, and why is she a doctor of the church? Because of her teaching, her doctrine, mainly her doctrine on the little way. She's a saint of our times, uh, given by God to help us. Now, what's the little way? Well, it, it, it's the, the, the name is, is very appropriate. Little things with great love. You know, St. Saint, Saint Therese knew that she wasn't capable of the grand penances that the saints that she'd read about had done. She couldn't fast for days on end. She, didn't, she wasn't that heroic, she didn't think, to do such grand things. But she could do little things. And, and she had absolute confidence in God. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a weapon here that is enormously powerful, and you can use it in this counterattack, and it's called trust, confidence in God. Uh, it's a biblical thing. If you, 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 can, you can check out anything I say. You take the Bible, you take a concordance of the Bible, and you look up the word trust or confidence, and you look up all the places in the Bible where that shows up, then you read those passages, and you'll see what I mean. It's a biblical thing. Trust God. The divine mercy devotion. Jesus, I trust in you. I have said that a million times from places of great pain, very often. Places where I didn't know how I'd get out. I had no idea how I would get to the next day. Jesus, I trust in you. Je and you say, well, I don't have enough trust. Well, amen, brother. You may not have enough trust, then get with it. Just saying that little prayer will increase your trust. You say, but Jesus, I, I trust in you, but I know I don't trust enough in you. I need to trust more in you. Well, we're all in that boat. Don't worry about that. You know, none of us trust, none of us do anything perfectly. But we're called to perfection. And so that's one way to practice that. You know, you say, I want to trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Increase my trust. When I begin the, I don't believe I ever be, begin the creed anymore in, for about the last five years, when I say, you know, uh, I believe in God or we believe in God, look, you know, I always, in, in my mind, when I say, uh, I believe in God, Lord, help my unbelief. And then I go on, you know, a little footnote there. I don't believe perfect, but I, I do believe everything the Catholic Church teaches with my whole heart. But I know intuitively that I don't believe enough because I'm human, I'm finite, I'm a creature. I believe in God. Lord, help my unbelief. Jesus, I trust in you. Lord, help me to trust more. There's a mystery in that. It's a powerful, powerful biblical reality, a spiritual weapon, trust. I always tell people that if, if you've got a problem, you know, you, whatever it is, you know, your son, your daughter's on drugs, uh, you've got cancer, all kinds of things. If you want all your prayers to take on increased power, trust. Pray with trust. Remember uh, St. Faustina. Uh, Jesus said to Faustina, trust 
uh, is like the um, container that you bring to the wellsprings of mercy. If you've got a lot of trust, you're going to bring away a lot of mercy. Like going to the well, right? You've got to get water. So you bring a, so you're going to go like they used to do, they, they still do it in, in, in places. Well, the women will go to the, to the fountain in the city square and they get water. Now, you can bring a thimble to the well and get a thimble worth of water. You can bring a, a bucket to the well and get a bucket full of water, you know. Or if you like my mother, you know, you can, uh, you can rent a tank truck and drive that up to the well and say, fill her up. <laughs> trust. Trust is the container with which we bring God's mercy into our life, you know. You want a lot of trust. You want expansive trust. That's another one of the things St. Therese taught us. Don't ask for little things. Man, you know, God is God. He's the great king. Uh, God is not poor. God's got everything. And he will, so ask for grand things. Like how about, you know, the salvation of your family, of all your children and grandchildren, or your parish, you know, your, your pastor. Ask for big things. Not little things, you know. And, and, and God, don't insult God. You know, if you uh, had you won some kind of an award from the United States and there was some or, or any place, and they say, "Well, we're giving you this this award for meritorious service. You can come and you come before the president, and he and you ask him anything you want. And um, you go in there and you say, "Oh, Mr. President, oh, I'd like a Big Mac." What? Man, don't insult me. You know, I, I, I ask for Texas or something. <laughs> you know? Well, I'd like Montana, Texas, and Wyoming, <laughs> Mr. President. All right. Well, that's it, the President. God can give you anything. That, that kind of expansive attitude is pleasing to God. Trust is pleasing to God. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. I, I struggle with it just like you. You know, I, I mean, I trust God, and I say that constantly, and, and he's shown me over the years that he loves me and he take, takes care of me. But, you know, uh, I, I've always had to support myself in the church. You know, I've never received a nickel uh, in terms of a salary or anything from the church. And so, I, but I've always been taken care of you know, by you, by the people, you know, you're the church. But, uh, you know, I worry about things like that. I shouldn't. I shouldn't, you know, but I do. You know, I didn't have medical insurance for years, and I'm getting older, and, well, things can happen, you know, and nobody can afford to pay actual, you know, your money that you earn. The medical costs are way too high. Nobody, I don't care how much money you have. You're not going to do that. My dad's last heart operation cost a million dollars by the time the smoke clear for the care after the surgery, the surgery, everything. Million bucks. Nobody can afford to pay actual money. If you have insurance, you know, the insurance, and a lot of people can't get insurance now. So I worry, you know, worry about that. And finally, I think, you know, God got sick of hear, hearing me worry. He says, man. You know, if God was Mr. T, he'd say, fool, <laughs> stop worrying. <laughs> so, you know, God gave me a little thing to do, you know, a little odd mission. And um, I said, nah, nah, what am I doing this for? You know, I'm too busy doing this. And then he gave me $8 million. He said, now shut up. <laughs> And I still worry. <laughs> so he's probably going to give me another eight million before it's over. But the point is, God is God. Be still and know that I am God. He's going to take care of you. And that trust, that absolute confidence, you know, it's the confidence 
there, there are some words in Scripture, you know, I, I'm not a, unfortunately, I came along too late in life to be a real scholar. Um, and, and in my generation, we really didn't have the, the kind of education they had in previous generations, like Father Lambert's generation. They, they had an education that uh, we don't get today. But I did the best I could with what I had. And, and that education I'm thankful for. I'm very thankful for. But I struggle with a lot of these things. I struggle with it. In the end, just trust God. You know, do what you've got to do. You know, you've got to do your part. You can't just sit back and say God will provide. Uh, God will provide, but you've got to do your end, okay? Now, uh, the way God works with me, he requires me to do what I'm able to do, okay? Um, and he knows me. He knows me better than I know me. He knows what I can do, and he knows what I can't do. So I just have to do my part. And you can be sure God will do his part. So you just do your part. You know, I, I put it this way. Um, all I do is show up for work. I just show up for work and put one foot in front of the other. That's all I have to do. Uh, I got to get out of bed in the morning. I've got to go to the airport, you know, and, and show up for work. Uh, I don't know how to preach. I don't know anything about this. I, I, when I think back on the fact that I had to begin my university studies in the church in my late 30s, I had to learn new languages and, and, and have the rigorous discipline of an academic life in the church. I look back on it, and, and I can't believe it. If I had to do it today, I could never do it. But you're given a grace when you need the grace. You're not given the grace some other time. You're given it when you need it. Trust God. Absolute confidence. The confidence of a little child. Now, I started to say I, my education isn't as, as good as the classical education that, that some of my predecessors received, but, and, and I'm not uh, real good in Greek. But Koine Greek, there are some key words in the New Testament. Pythos is one. Oh, that's a child. That word means a, you know, a child that's still uh, young enough that it's still de totally dependent on its parents. And that's the word that's used to express to us in the Bible, in the New Testament, the way we should be with God, like a dependent child. I know I can't do anything. I'm going to tell you something. I, I know I have to do what I can do. But I also know what most other people don't know about me is that I am totally incapable. I am absolutely inept. I have no strength, whether it's physical, emotional, or moral, to do, to do this, to, to do this mission, to accomplish this mission. I know that. You know, you may say, oh, you're just being humble, Father. Nope, I'm being honest. I'm being honest. I know from past experience. I know me a little bit, and um, God does too. I just show up for work. But I have absolute confidence that the Holy Spirit is going to give me everything I need. I don't care. I'll preach to the College of Cardinals this afternoon with no preparation and do just fine. And by, by golly, I'll even preach to the local high school. And that's more than the College of Cardinals, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> the College of Cardinals be easy. You know, and, and it's not pride. It's not arrogance, because I know I can't do it. I know I can't convince anybody of anything. But I know when I show up for work, God shows up. I can't do it without him. And you're the same way. You, you may feel helpless at times to be a parent. You may feel helpless in school sometimes. Man, I can't do this. I know the feeling. You might not be able to. For man, it's impossible. But for God, all things are possible. And so you just have that total confidence. Foster the truth. Man, learn the catechism. There is no excuse for anybody, any Catholic, and even non-Catholics. I have a lot of real fine Protestant friends 
who study the catechism of the Catholic Church. It, it starts out for no other reason that they're serious people. They love their Christian faith. And they say, well, let's see, you know, we don't agree with you guys. I want to see why we don't agree with you for myself. And so they start, I, I say, well, first, you ought to see what we believe. You know, don't, don't, there's a lot of misconceptions about what Catholics believe. So get the catechism if you're serious about it. And, um, and you may not have to, you don't have to agree with it. But just read it in order to educate yourself to see what we believe. If it makes any sense to you, ask questions. And um, if nothing else, you'll become better in your own faith because you'll know what we believe. And you'll be able to refute it then, you think. <laughs> But, you know, that's how you start anyway. I mean, but, but it's, you know, hey, don't say we worship Mary when we don't. You know, I, I get, every once in a while I get into that, especially in the South, somebody will stop me and say, oh, you Catholics. <laughs> you worship Mary. No, we don't. Yes, you do. No, we don't. Yes, you do. Man, where did you get your doctorate in Catholic theology? You know, I know where I got mine. We do not. We love her. We do. We love her. We respect her. She is the mother of Jesus, but we worship God alone. God alone. But Jesus loves his mother. Now, you know, you all love your mother. Even if she's passed away, you, you love your mother, the remembrance of her. You, you honor your mother. I mean, you, there's got to be something wrong with you if you don't love your mother. You are a sick person if you don't love your mother. Now, you know that. That's true. I understand there are reasons. There are reasons we have um, wounds. Maybe mom and dad weren't what they should have been, and that's very common, you know. And I sympathize with that. My dad wasn't what he should have been when I was young. Um, but now that I'm older, I understand how people can make mistakes and so forth. And, and he, he was good in his later years, and that's what... That's what, it's, it, what matters is how you end up. That's what matters most of all. Because the state of your soul at the moment of death is what matters. What, happened, what, what you were like 50 years ago or 30 years ago, um, you're not that person today. What matters is what you are today because it's what you are the moment you die that determines how you live forever. You know, that, that's, that's the mercy and, and, and glory of the way God does things. All right, study the catechism. If you don't like to read books, make sure, you know, you get my series on the catechism. I, 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 I you know, I don't like to do commercials for myself, but uh, I'll tell you the truth. I would tell, if there was other stuff, I'd tell you to get that, but there isn't. I am, I'm amazed to this day that there is no other series on the catechism of the Catholic Church like mine. Why not? I mean, there are plenty of people smarter than me. Don't get me wrong. There are a bunch of people better educated than me, much smarter than I am. Nobody's just gotten around to doing it, I guess. But there is no, there are, there are little things on the catechism. But there is no 50-part series. You know, I took the whole catechism of the Catholic Church and s distilled it as best I could uh, into 48 one-hour lectures. It's the whole catechism. You, you know, CDs, audio cassettes, DVDs, VHS, whatever you want. Well, it costs a little bit of money, but it's worth it. I, I, I'll tell you something. What's it worth to know your faith? Man, that'll get you to heaven. I'll guarantee you. You learn it and then live it. That will propel you right into heaven. It will. So, learn, however you learn it, just learn it. If you can do it from the book, just from the catechism, reading it, good. Do it that way. If you need help from audio or video material, do that. But do it. There's no excuse not to know your faith. The consequences of not knowing your faith are disastrous. Not just for you, but for the whole world. The reason the world is sinking into hell under the weight of its own iniquity is because we Catholics haven't corresponded to the grace of our vocation. Oh, the problem isn't out there. The problem is in here. The problem isn't with the neo-pagan world. The problem is with the Catholic Church. 
That's the real problem. We have not corresponded to the grace of our noble vocation. The average Catholic knows nothing about their faith, has not taken the time to learn it. It's not rocket science. My grandmother was a very good theologian, one of the best. And the furthest she went in school was eighth grade. Man, she knew her faith. She wasn't a technician, but she knew the basics of the faith. And she'll put some of the theologians today to shame. Why? She had faith. They don't. Foster the good. You know, if you want to foster truth, foster the good, foster unity, foster beauty. They're all interconnected. They're all one. Live a moral life. Ten Commandments. Vatican II did not change it to the Ten Suggestions. It's the Ten Commandments, and they bind always and everywhere, and no one has the power to dispense from them. Do you know what the Ten Commandments are? Well, we've had a little bit of time to get it. I mean, after all, God gave them to Moses. <laughs> now, you just stop in your tracks and say, well, do I really even know what the Ten Commandments are? We assume a lot of things. Man, we assume a lot of stuff. I remember my, my high school chemistry teacher, Mr. Stiles. The first day of class, we'd come in there, and he'd write up on the back blackboard. We were talking about uh, chemistry and, and um, different formulas and so forth. He wrote up, never assume. And he would write the word assume on the blackboard with a flourish. And then he would take the chalk and he'd make a slash mark. Never assume, A-S-S -S slash, you slash me. Never assume because you'll make a out of you and me. <laughs> we assume a lot of things. The best way to, to check and see if you're assuming too much or if you're presumptuous is to test yourself. Nothing like testing. We don't like testing because, you know, tests make us anxious. Man, I, I sat through so many tests in school. I, I've had 24 years of formal education. 24 years sitting in classrooms, 12 years after high school. That's a lot of years sitting there taking tests. I don't like tests any better than anybody else. But if you're prepared, I, I, you, know, you know what I like less than tests? Being scared. I like being scared less than anything. And the way not to be scared is to be prepared. I'd walk into a classroom for a test at the university, like the heavyweight champion of the world who knew he was going to just beat the tar out of his opponent. I would walk in there with the attitude, come on. <laughs> and then I get an A plus because I was prepared. I didn't want to get in the ring unprepared. You don't want to get in the ring with a fierce opponent unprepared. You know, I remember when I was a boy, I used to watch fights with my grandfather, and my dad was a, was a boxer, too, for a while, and, and uh, we'd watch Rocky Marciano. And Rocky was, was, was usually um, smaller than his opponent, you know, uh, but Rocky was so prepared. I mean, he, would, he was so strong and so well-trained, and he had an attitude. And the attitude was, you have to kill me to whip me. There's just no way on earth you're going to win. You can't. I walk into an examination room, and there's no way on earth I'm not getting an A+. Plus. No way. It ain't possible. Because I know this stuff up one side and down the other. I am prepared. And then I wasn't scared. Be prepared, and you won't be scared. And that holds true for anything in life. We should be the best we can be. Why? 
We belong to Jesus Christ. Why are you studying? Give glory to God. Why are you cleaning the toilet? Live, give glory to God. And believe you me, you can do either one with perfection. And that's the key. That's part of that little way I talked about. You can be a saint being a mom cleaning the house. Do everything you do with perfection. Now that is one of the major things that we can do in this counterattack. Very important. How are you going to foster beauty? Foster the truth. The splendor of truth. The symphonic beauty of truth. Uh, you've heard that expression, truth is symphonic. That, that's a, an expression from, I don't know, was it de Lubach who wrote that? I'm not sure, but, but as a Catholic author in recent times, I believe, talked about truth as being symphonic. You know what that means? Uh, music. You may not, I don't know anything about music. I have no aptitude for music. But, but I, I know beautiful music if I hear it. And I also know a discordant note if I hear it. A beautiful symphony isn't filled with discord. A beautiful symphony, it goes together. It, it's got an integrity to it. It's mathematically beautiful. You know, you can translate music into mathematics, and there's an order to it. And that order has an integrity or unity. There's an intrinsic truth to it. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So you want to cultivate beauty, cultivate truth. Insist on it. Insist on truth, especially in the church. I would, I, there, you know, part of the reason that God made me a priest and he didn't allow me to stay as a lay person, I probably would have killed somebody. I, I, I would have never made it as a lay person. I would have thrown somebody out the fourth store window. It would have been a bad scene. I could have never done it. I, when I was a novice, they had some guy come in and give a, a retreat, and he was nuts. He was out of his mind. He came in there attacking the Holy Father. He came in there saying, oh, well, you know, abortion under certain circumstances isn't so bad. It should be per permitted. And two of my confreres had to hold me down because I was furious. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing. Now, that's a um, defect on my part. That, I always think about St. Louis de Montfort. He's one of my favorite saints. And when St. Louis was younger, you know, he, he was in, in Brittany, in, in France, and he was a mission preacher. And he was also the strongest man in Brittany. And uh, he could lift a barrel of molasses straight up, you know, and weightlifting would call it a snatch. You don't even stop here. Just whoop, right up. He can do that with a whole big barrel of molasses. He's a big, strong man. And he'd be preaching. I mean, this is right in his official church biography. He'd be preaching, and it might be next to the, the bar room, and the boys were in there on Sunday drinking. And they'd start making fun of him. And St. Louis would excuse himself out of the pulpit, go next door, and John Wayne the place. <laughs> I mean, he'd clean house. And the next day of the mission, the boys would be coming in with black eyes and broken noses, and they'd be sitting right in the front pew. Why? Because he told them to. <laughs> I like St. Louis. <laughs> now, you know, that wasn't something to brag about. That wasn't a good thing on his part. He had a bad temper and the physical attributes to go with it. Later in life, he overcame that. You know, he became more peaceable you know, more civilized. Um, and then they poisoned him and almost killed him. But he went on anyway, and he became a saint. All these things go together. Can't leave any of them out. If you want to foster any one of these transcendentals, look at the others. And what will happen? You, you, want, you want truth to flourish. I want uh, the fullness of the teaching in the Catholic Church to be accepted far and wide, um, then I better be a good boy. Then I better be good. My life 
had better radiate what I teach. There had better not be a big gap between what I say and what I live. Because if that's the case, nobody's going to come. Nobody's going to buy it. The Holy Father has said repeatedly that in our generation, there is a gap, a large, wide gap between what we profess and what we live. I would dare say in this country today, and perhaps in most of the so-called civilized world, the average Catholic is no different than the average citizen. We are not a countercultural force to be reckoned with. We have been downsized morally, and that is unacceptable. We have to narrow the gap between what we profess, what we believe, and what we live. We need to live exactly what we profess. And when that happens, what are, what are you doing? You're giving witness to the truth. You're giving witness to the good and you are affecting unity thereby, and that is beautiful. And what will happen? Life will flourish. Abortion will go away, wars will subside, evil will be overcome, darkness will be cast out by the light, and victory will be the final result. Yeah, it's a war. It's a tremendous, fierce, dour combat between the forces of good and evil. But in the end, you can do what you've got to do with confidence. You can go forward with absolute trust. Because in the end, you see, we know the last chapter of the book. We win. God bless you.